Steve Rudd, uh, he's, um, he's doing it all. He's going to give us an academic presentation and he's advertising his stuff. He's a slick rascal, isn't he? <laughs> right? and, I, and I hope you can appreciate his tie as well. So, uh, Stephen Rudd, Tower of Babel, archaeology and dating. So this all began uh, 2019, uh, I published this book, and the topic is the uh, Nimrod and the dating and archaeology of the Tower of Babel. Now in order to begin with the dating uh, portion of the talk, uh, it's important to recognize what everybody knows is the elephant in the room, is that there are two chronologies. One is the Septuagint chronology and one is the Masoretic chronology, and they differ significantly. Now, I'm a young earth creationist. I believe in a global flood. I believe in the literal inspiration of scripture. <clears throat> so I believe, I follow, based on uh, Henry Smith's uh, uh, landmark work in showing the Septuagint is correct over the Masoretic, that creation is 5554 BC. As opposed to creation and the Masoretic, it's uh, 4174. In the Septuagint, uh, the flood is dated to 3298, but over in the Masoretic text, it's dated to 2518. Uh, I date the Tower of Babel, as you'll see, to 2850 BC, and I date the Tower of Babel with the Masoretic text to 2275. So what I did was I began by just using the Bible alone <clears throat> and trying to decipher uh, the date for the Tower of Babel. And I came up with eight Bible markers from a unit of text, Genesis 10 to 11, that I believe decodes the date of the Tower of Babel to 2850, plus or minus 25 years. Now, the first Bible marker is that this unit of text, Genesis 10 and 11, uh, is in fact a, uh, it's all about the division at Babel. And what's interesting, when you study it, Nimrod founded Babel, and I believe, I'm going to propose that he built the Tower of Babel, but he was the only one to retain the same geographic territory before and after the division in Assyria. Now you can see down here, this is the area we're talking about, uh, Eridu is where I believe the Tower of Babel is, and there's the Ur of Chaldees where Abraham lived, and there's uh, Uruk, his home area. You can also see the modern, uh, the modern shoreline versus the ancient shoreline where all of the cities were built. Uh, that shows you that sea levels back immediately after the flood were much higher. And that is because the, immediately after the flood, the polar ice caps hadn't formed. And thank you, Canada, we saved the world because the North Pole, we own Santa Claus. That's what made the sea levels drop. <coughs> it's very instructive to see where these uh, cities were built. So Bible marker number two, Nimrod is the central figure of this core of text. He, 79 words are devoted to him, and more words are devoted to Nimrod than any other descendant from Noah to Abraham in this section. So to the Hebrews at Mount Sinai in 1446, Nimrod, as the central figure, makes sense as the inventor, as you will see I propose, of all the Assyrian gods beyond the river who also built the Tower of Babel, but Nimrod to the Hebrews as Sargon I in 2300 BC is, in my opinion, irrelevant to the Hebrews at Sinai. So here you see Nimrod, the great hunter, and he's trying to get dinner. Now, Bible marker number three, there are more important, the more important relatives, like Nimrod, are narrated last by design. The narration lists the five sons of Cush, but initially excludes Nimrod, then lists the two important grandsons, then backtracks to list Nimrod, the most important son of Cush. And this follows a pattern. Now, Bible marker number four, uh, Jeff and Ham provide a genealogical time marker. The key to decoding the date for the Tower of Babel is not what information is given in the Jephthah Ham list, but where the information stops. Genesis identifies uh, the Babel veterans, those that lived through the Tower of Babel as the second generation. And here are the chronological charts with the stop markers. And so we find in this section that we can see that this initial time window, uh, 3161 to 2700 BC, 
uh, is based upon the second generation timing. It's a broader window. Now, Bible marker number five, Heber was a Babel veteran who had his language changed from the universal pre-Babel flood, the language of Noah on the ark, to Hebrew at the Tower of Babel as the first Hebrew-speaking Shemite. As we'll also see, there was no written language before the Tower of Babel because they had a universal language. So when Abraham was called the Hebrew in Genesis 14, 13, it directly ties back to Heber, the father of Peleg, in Genesis 10, 21. And as Dr. Eugene Merle fitly said, a Hebrew thus was an Eberite. Bible marker number six is the Shem chronology begins by skipping forward four generations to the first dynasty of natural born Hebrew language speakers, the children of Hebrew, or Peleg. So the text reads, to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the children were born. So the unique structure at the start of the Shem list in Genesis 10, 21, is the very first fact we learn about Shem is that he was the father of Eber, Eber's descendants, putting that emphasis on the Tower of Babel. Moses shows his fellow Hebrews that their Hebrew language at Sinai in 1446 is traced back to Heber. Moses associates the natural-born speakers at Sinai for the first natural Hebrew speakers, the children of Heber or Peleg. Bible marker number seven. Peleg was a Babel baby boomer born after the division of language. Now, I would like all of you to say Babel baby boomer three times. Go. And as I predicted, he could not resist. I love Gary Byers. Two sons were born to Eber. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his older brother's name was Joktan. Now, as we look at this, there's a wrong and a right way, in my opinion, on how to approach it. I think the wrong way is that Peleg was born before the Great Division. I think the right way is that Heber named his son Divided as a memorial name of the division that occurred before he was born. If Peleg was born before the division, he would never have been named Division. And we find there's a pattern in uh, modern history, the First World War, there is thousands of babies named after the war, Verdum, Vimy Ridge, Flanders, like imagine your name, who are you? Oh, I'm Vimy Ridge. But this was a, an aspect of respect of a major world event. So in the same way, I believe that uh, Peleg was a memorial name of a past event. Bible marker number eight, there's a 200 year lifespan reduction after the Tower of Babel. Now, man's days, it says, shall be 120 years. Now, it took Noah between 25 and no more than 75 years to build the ark. Shem was 98 years old at the flood, was married when he was ordered by God uh, to build the ark with Noah and his sons to build the ark. So there is a dramatic, noticeable, and consistent drop in lifespan of those born after the Tower of Babel. Now, the last key to understanding the, <clears throat> the dating the Tower of Babel is the population heuristic of the flood to Babel, where they began with six, I begin with six, and I leave Noah and his wife out, six people to 12 million over a period of 400 and 50 years. So how did I accomplish this? <clears throat> well, in Samaria, or sorry, in Somalia in 2018, had a population growth, growth of 3.8. That's a real world event. So what I use is for the first 100 years, um, 5%, and then after that I drop down to 3% for the next uh, 400, 300 years. So we begin with six people and we end up over 450 years with 12 million people in 2850 BC. So during the lifetime of the second generation after the flood is when the Tower of Babel broad window is. Before the birth of Peleg, which is 2767, is a more narrow end marker and a population sufficient to build the stepped pyramid in Saqqara in 2660 BC, uh, which was the oldest pyramid that I'm aware of on Earth. Now, I developed a system called Christian Archaeological Dating in 2019, 
uh, as a young earth creationist, I do not believe, as many archaeologists in this room would agree, uh, that there is no archaeological uh, age or anything that predates the flood. It is the beginning marker of all archaeology on earth, 3298. Now, most of the ages we're going to be talking about, the assemblages we're going to be talking about, and archaeological ages predate the flood and the creation of the world, for that matter, like Natufian, for example, is 11,000 BC. So here is an example of you know, some of the ages we're going to be talking about. You know, you've got uh, the Stone Age, Halef, the Sunna, Ubaid, uh, Uruk, etc. And so what we have then is... Uh, 3298, and at that time Noah established the northern kingdom of Arata, or Ararat, established in 3298, shortly thereafter. Nimrod was born, I believe, around, in the second generation, around 3225, and then you have the Hulaf, Sunnah, Ubaid assemblages that all are happening concurrently, a little bit. And then you have the southern kingdom of Uruk is established by Nimrod about 3200, when he was about age 25. Nimrod then uh, takes about 100 years to conquer the northern kingdom of Ararat during the Ubaid III expansion, and then we move down to the Tower of Babel, which occurred, I believe, uh, at the Uruk III expansion immediately after. That's what the expansion was triggered by the division, which was the beginning of Early Bronze I and Egyptian Dynasty Zero. So Nimrod was a major player in shaping uh, uh, civilization in, in the earliest times after the flood because you've got, for example, uh, you know, up here in 3225 he's born, he comes down and he uh, establishes the kingdom down here in the land of Shinar, and then during the Ubaid III expansion, 3000 BC, he moves forward up into this area. And we recognize uh, this, this uh, amazing um, uh, vessel called a bevel rim bowl. Um, and for example, at Cholgamish, and here you've got, you know, here's, uh, here's Uruk, his, um, his home area, and here's uh, Eridu. And, and here's these two red circles, Cholgamish and Gershu. They found 250,000 bevel rim bowls at uh, Cholgamish and as well as at uh, Gershu. And at Gershu they found these uh, symbolic little uh, tokens. There's bread, there's oil. And this plays into the narrative that there was no written language before Babel, but they did have a communication system. So Nimrod won over the people through, not through violence, but through improved living conditions, better technology and idol worship. Under Nimrod, food was mass-produced in bread factories using bevel rim bowls to feed workers in these massive food factories. The first trade routes were established, the first mud brick and pitch temples, which is exactly what the Tower of Babel was built from. Uh, fine pottery was made. The earliest pottery after the flood was finely made by chromeware with intricate designs after the Tower of Babel when the first uh, after the Tower of Babel, when the early Bronze Age I began, the quality of pottery is noticeably reduced, with the exception of Kerbet uh, ware in the Levant. So we can see that um, uh, the, the bevel rim bowls are found all over the Levant uh, during the, 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 the post-Tower uh, of Babel period. <clears throat> and so here we have uh, the northern kingdom of, of Ararat, uh, number two, we've got a kingdom in the south, you've got two competing kingdoms, and the southern kingdom uh, overtakes the northern kingdom uh, down to the Tower of Babel, that's why he was a great ruler. So I'm going to bring in a couple of foresights. Uh, first, uh, uh, Tepigara, uh, and you can see where it's located up there near uh, modern uh, Mosul. Uh, this is, in my opinion, this is before the Tower of Babel. Nimrod expands north in 3000 BC. Here we have uh, two assemblages in the, in the stratum. You've got uh, a Halaf assemblage, and you've got a Ubaid assemblage in red. So here we have a Halaf culture peacefully overtaken by the, at the Ubaid III ex expansion, in my opinion. But notice the important thing. We have five interbedded stratum right here. Now, rule num number one of stratigraphy is interbedded stratum were contemporaneous. They happened at the same time. So what this does is this actually helps support, Gara supports that Halaf and Ubaid archaeological ages were concurrent, not consecutive. 
And it, Gaura also confirms my major thesis in Christian archaeological dating uh, that different cultures uh, existed at the same time, and they are not in intended to be sequential, but they occurred together, side by side. <coughs> and so the second site, this is uh, Habuba Kabira, and I, I date this before the Tower of Babel, founding of the new, uh, founding of a new Ubaid tree expansion northern city with southern Uruk assemblage around 3000 BC. So what they did was they came from the south and moved forth, uh, moved, moved north, and established a brand new city. Uh, the report notes that pottery seals, ideology, accounting practices, use of space, building techniques, like mud brick and pitch, are indistinguishable from those at Uruk. And Hassan Tepi, uh, founded after the Tower of Babel. Here we have a city where there's a peaceful coexistence of two distinct cities of Ubaid and Uruk assemblages, and I believe this is good evidence of um, a dual language. And here we have the city. These are both walled cities, and there's nine distinctions you can see over here. And here's the, the one city, here's the other city. And what we've got is they're, they're side by side. Well, why? Well, remember that the, the pre-flood vegetarians versus the Nimrod Uruk meat eaters, that's what he was famous for. Now, a comparison, the report notes that a comparison of animal bones between Uruk and Ubaid parts of the site, the two different cities, show differences in food preferences. The Ubaid consumption of sheep and goats was 49%, but Uruk was 80 to 90%. So if you see, you see the difference in eating habits of those of the northern uh, kingdom of Ararat and the southern kingdom. So he was a mighty hunter of meat. Uh, Hamakar, I date after the Tower of Babel. It's a hostile burning of a Ubaid city in the Uruk III expansion after 2850 BC. And you can see how it's, it's located um, up north here, uh, right near um, uh, Nineveh a bit. The older Ubaid assemblages were replaced by Uruk assemblages, including tripartite houses, formal niches of temples, again with mud, brick, and pitch, like the Tower of Babel, for the pagan gods. But sling stones and skeletons were excavated, indicating war. This was a hostile takeover. The city was burned and rebuilt, and I believe this was after the Tower of Babel. Now let's move forward to some of our discussion about Nimrod himself. And we're going to look at ancient Christian sources, Nim, uh, Jerome, Ephraim the Syrian, Augustine. So the summary is that Nimrod built the Tower of Babel. Eber was the first Hebrew-speaking person who had his language changed to, Hebrew, to speak Hebrew. Peleg was born at or after the Tower of Babel and naturally learned Hebrew as a child. The ancient Jewish sources, the unanimous opinion is that Nimrod was the second generation from Ham. Nimrod founded uh, Babel and built the Tower of Babel. Heber was an eyewitness of the Tower of Babel and the first Hebrew speaker. Peleg was born during or after the Great Dispersion, and none connected uh, Shem with Melchizedek, and none connected Nimrod with Sargon I. And here we have the Book of Jubilees, Philo, Josephus, Seteralon, Rabbah, and the Babylonian Talmud. Now, from the much later Masoretic Jewish sources, um, like the Targums in 700 and 900 AD, they are the first ones to connect Nimrod with Sargon I using the Masoretic text chronology that had Shem alive at the time of Abraham and Nimrod alive at the, age of Abraham, at the time of Abraham. And we see there's a couple of stories here where, where um, uh, Nimrod um, actually. Uh, uh, threw Abraham into a furnace of fire. Uh, but they noted that Nimrod was a second generation from Ham. Yes, they viewed Shem was Melchizedek, uh, but none connected Nimrod with Sargon I. Modern scholars, uh, I searched my Logos library, 11 or 12,000 volumes, just to show you the, 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 the extent of the search, which is pretty big. 16 modern scholars suggested a connection between Nimrod and Sargon I. So this is not a new, a new connection, but all use the Masoretic text chronology and all viewed Nimrod as, liter, as Noah's literal great-grandson, two generations from Cush. Case in point, 
Uh, Paul Tanner in 2015 said Nimrod was two generations removed from Ham and therefore parallel with Shelah, whose dates are roughly 2506 to 2073, using the MT. It seems Nimrod is Sargon, the great of Akkad. But then in 2017, uh, Henry Smith came along and validated the LXX chronology, the Septuagint chronology. And uh, today there are some that advocate still using the uh, Septuagint chronology, like uh, Doug Petrovich, who argues that Nimrod is Sargon I um, with the Septuagint chronology, but he has a novel theory that Nimrod was the distant relative of Cush rather than uh, his literal son. So moving again to some of the ancient uh, writings, the Sumerian flood stories, uh, um, Eridu, the uh, Atrahasis, Gilgamesh, uh, it is my opinion that it was Nimrod who fabricated a new complex pantheon of Assyrian pagan gods to worship, including the supreme god Anu, who decreed the flood, and his betraying son Enki, pictured here, who warned the Noah figure to build the ark, to build a boat, and it was Enki who caused the divisions. So in my book, I demonstrate that Nimrod seems to have invented Enki as a god in his own image, with 20 direct parallels. So Enki, the god of fresh water, and the son of An, the supreme god, is portrayed as the savior hero of mankind for warning Noah of the decree and instructing him to build the ark. So it was Enki who told the Noah figure to build the ark. Now, one last piece of literature, and this is a significant piece. It's called Emnikar and the Lord of Arata. What it is, is the northern kingdom of Ararat, one king, and the southern kingdom uh, down at Uruk. Now, I believe that uh, Emnikar is an excellent candidate for Nimrod. It's speculative, but that's my opinion. These four Sumerian stories on clay cuneiform tablets are considered some of the oldest poetry on earth and date to about 2100 BC. I was really taken back by the volume. We're talking like a hundred pages of, of text in a modern book. This is a, and there's many copies of these extant. The stories revolve around two kings, Ennekar, the southern kingdom of Uruk, and Eshagarna, the northern kingdom of Ararat. And Ennekar appears in the Sumerian king's list, over here you can see, as the ruler of Uruk. These four poems clearly echo earth history between creation, the flood, down to the Tower of Babel. And so what you find is that there is no fear of the animals before the flood. There was one language before Babel. The Tower of Babel is Enki's temple, and Enki caused the division of um, the languages. So let's go right into the excavation report. Uh, I was able to acquire this. Uh, the Iraqi Antiquities Department in 1945 to 49, published in 1981. Um, and here is the uh, 12 meter uh, deep stratigraphic sequence of the 17 temples that I believe were built by Nimrod at Eridu. And here they are, you can see the the, the stratigraphy uh, in their report. So just one more time to show you where this is. You can see here's Eridu with the, the blue dot and there's the Ur of Chaldees and there's, uh, there's Uruk. So this is the area we're talking about. Now these temples, the 17 temples were built one on top of the other. Now think of a deck of cards. And if you push the cards sideways, you end up with this beautiful isometric drawing from their report. So down here, the lowest level, Temple 17, is uh, built below, and all the rest come up, and then finally Temple 1. Now, there was also then, at the same time as Temple 1, there was this enlarged platform we're going to talk about, then there was an abandonment period of 750 years, and then Ernanu built his, his ziggurat in 3100 BC. So... In my opinion, Nimrod likely built the first pagan temple in 3200 BC. Temple 17, the first one, three by three meters, was dedicated to the god Enki. We're pretty certain of that. Uh, at Eridu, which featured a niche altar room in, in which to place an altar of, of Enki. You can see the, the altar, 
and the niche, and a burnt offering table, and they were offering goatfish, which are Euphrates River carp. And you can see the entranceway. So um, what we find then is here's the relative size of Temple 1 down here, the last temple in the green, and then this enlarged platform, which is 300 meters square, which I believe was built at the time uh, of the Tower of Babel, which is the actual platform for the Tower of Babel, that yellow, uh, and here you can see the size of it. Uh, and so the sequence of events, you have the global flood in 3298, Nimrod 17 temples, and then in 2850, he builds the Tower of Babel platform, probably started constructing something in the middle, then you've got the division of languages. The site was abandoned and unoccupied for 750 years. Why? I think it's because what happened there creeped them out. Nobody would go near it for to get jinxed by the gods. Bad stuff happened there. Well, now finally, after 750 years, Urnamu builds a ziggurat on top of it. And so here's, here's a, a top plan of what the site looks like of the ziggurat. Now, what's interesting, the Nimrod's first 17 mud brick temples at Eridu, over here, at Babel, was dedicated to Enki, as was his Tower of Babel, as was the ziggurat of Urnamu in 2100. In Sumerian myths, it was Enki who caused the division of languages, as we've seen at Eridu. So here's what the site looks like today. This is what the, the ziggurat would look like. And this is the site over here. It's quite amazing. Um, and this is what I believe is the ruins of underneath this, uh, the ruins of the Tower of Babel. What you see on top is the ziggurat of Urnamu. Now, just a footnote, uh, in 2100 BC, Urnamu built twin identical ziggurats. One at the Ur of Chaldees where uh, Abraham was living, and you can see it here. This is the one that Saddam Hussein uh, uh, fixed in, in 1990, and it was dedicated to the moon god Nana, and the other one was at Eridu, uh, and it was dedicated to the freshwater god Enki. So you've got two pyramids built at the same time. And again, here's where these are located. Just to show you again, there they are, Ur and Eridu, side by side. Now, the excavators found uh, impressed um, mud bricks imprinted, uh, stamped, uh, of, of uh, Urnamu, whose son, all the way down to even Nebuchadnezzar. And here from the excavation report, you can see places where they found the mud bricks. You're seeing, you're looking at the monumental staircase here. And over here, this is the monumental staircase in the isometric. And so this is, they actually found the staircase. So they know the ziggurat here and the one over at Ur. Uh, that people can visit today were essentially identical. Here's another picture of the monumental staircase. Now, I believe Nimrod invented Ayana, uh, the, the goddess of love, but why? Because in the story of Enmakar and the Lord of Arata, you have, um, and, and this of course was, um, you know, excavated uh, at Uruk, this, this image of her, this, this artifact. Uh, the southern king, Emnikar, who I believe is the Nimrod figure, and the northern king of Arata, both kings boast that Ayanna prefers them. Emnikar boasts that she loves him more because he spent 50 years building her first mud, brick, and bitumen temple. That's significant. All I can say is, if you look at this girl, this, this is a pretty nasty-looking girl. I don't think I'd want to take her to a jazz concert. She looks mean. <laughs> Why would you worship that? Anyway, so what we've got here is we go through a catalog of the, uh, the 17 temples. Seven, temple 17 and 16 were very, very similar. So we've already talked about this one. And we go down, this is, I believe, 3175, you buy one. We go to, we jump to Temple 8, and this is 3000 during the Ubaid 3 expansion. You can see this is the first temple that has a lot of uh, a lot of changes in architecture, storage rooms, but it still has the little niche area and the altar at the end and the offering for burnt, for burnt fish here. Now, what they found underneath this, uh, this uh, beside this altar over here, where, where the altar pagan god would stand on top of it, they found this, this tortoise vessel. 
This is an example of the high quality. This is fineware. It's thin. It's beautiful. It's bichrome. It's very finely made. And they found it over here as a whole vessel. And guess what they found inside that? The report says they found the goatfish, as you see pictured here, the Euphrates goatfish. Why? Because Nimrod was the god of fresh water, and the Euphrates, the goatfish. And so what you find here in the roller seal that it does picture Enki, the roller seal of 2300 BC, what do you see is goatfish, the same species, and the zooarchaeologists are certain that that's what species they are. Now, Nimrod's next temple, I jump to Temple 6, and you can see a beautiful uh, uh, drawing of it, three-dimensional isometric drawing. And again, over here under the burnt offering, they found burnt mud bricks and many, many goatfish bones. So what's interesting is Nimrod was offering a bloodless sacrifice in, in rebellion to what God wants with a blood sacrifice. Eridu final temple, the last one, you can see pictured here. I believe this is uh, about 25 years before he started to build the Tower of Babel, the early Europe three. You can see from the excavation this, this uh, colossal area, which is re represented here on the isometric drawing. <clears throat> and so, once again, you can see the relative size of Temple 1, the green, the last temple that we just looked at in Nimrod's platform, and the size of the platform here. And the sequence again, there was an abandonment for 750 years of the yellow platform, which predated the ziggurat by 750 years. So as an architectural mirror, uh, when I was on a tour of um, on the Nile, I was uh, actually editing this book, and I had... Uh, I was looking at this drawing, and that day I went to Saqqara, to Djoser's Egyptian temple, and his, the oldest pyramid on earth, as people are saying. What I noticed were three architectural similarities. Notice from the temple at Eridu, you've got zigzag niched wall, high inset doors, and long vertical inset recesses, exactly like the Saqqara temple of Djoser. So that's why I propose that the um, the, the Tower of Babel uh, probably was replicating the architecture that they had done 200 years earlier um, and that the Tower of Babel probably looks like the Saqqara Temple. Here are the oldest pyramids on earth. You've got um, this, the, uh, the Djoser's Temple. This is the Kara, the Karl Ziggurat in Peru, which is only 60 years later. That's what I believe the Tower of Babel looked like. So scripture says they built the Tower of Babel to reach God. Archaeology tells us it was to get closer to Enki, who saved mankind from Noah's flood, and to be high enough to escape a second flood just in case Enki was asleep. The Tower of Babel was total rebellion to the one true God. Now the excavators report that the ziggurat displaced a previous ancient temple of the same age as the ancient platform. The platform, there was also a temple. Now they tried digging in by hand, but it was dangerous and difficult. The excavators understood that a temple different from Temple 1, the last one, existed in the middle of that 300-foot platform, on top of which the new ziggurat was built in 2100 BC. This means that the remnants of Nimrod's Tower of Babel may lay under the middle of the later ziggurat of Urnamu. Tel Eridu is remote, desolate, abandoned, and would be quite easy to excavate with modern excavation equipment. So I ask, with a professional team, is there an archaeologist in the house? I need a dig director, I need somebody to register pottery, I need somebody to read fish bones, somebody to make coffee, somebody with $25 million, and finally, somebody to solve world peace. Uh -oh. <laughs> that might be a sign from God. I don't know. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> It's okay. Yeah, and Thank you, George. Carry on. One final note, and I'm done. Chronologically, we know from both the Masoretic and the Septuagint, they, they agree up to the birth of Abraham 
in 2166. We know that Abraham left the Ur of the Chaldees in 2100. That's exactly the same year that Ernamu started building. So there's Abraham in Ur of Chaldees, and he starts building the, the ziggurat to the moon god. And at the same time, as in rebellion to God, they start rebuilding the Tower of Babel, God taps Abraham on the shoulder and says, it's time to get out of here. Thank you very much. My books are on Amazon. Are there any questions? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Yes. If you can.